So um, thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here. I, I love being on Nantucket and uh, feel very honored to be speaking with Jamie Jones and Nat Felbrick. So um, thank you all. So uh, Melville, I'm just going to do a very brief begin at the beginning uh, talk about Melville's uh, time at sea and how it tied to the <coughs> books he wrote. So Melville was born on August 1st, 1819, as you all know, 200th anniversary this year. Um, he was born in New York City. He actually considered himself a New Yorker, which is interesting because most of us associate him with the Berkshire Mountains of Massachusetts. Um, he sailed from New York to Liverpool and back to New York aboard the packet ship St. Lawrence in 1839 at the age of 19. And from that came his fourth book, Redburn, uh, the subtitle of his being the sailor boy confessions of the son of a gentleman. And essentially that's what he was, was the son of a gentleman. Uh, his, uh, uh, his father had been part of the sort of upper middle class, but then his father had died when he uh, had gone bankrupt when he was 10 and died when Melville was 12. And suddenly the family was thrust into poverty. Uh, so his mother and uh, uh, widowed mother and eight children. Um, and so that's how come he ended up sailing as an ordinary sailor rather than an officer. Somebody of his, of his family background probably would have gone to sea as an officer, but he sailed as an ordinary sailor. And then he left January 3rd, 1841 from Fairhaven, Massachusetts, right across the river from New Bedford, um, aboard the Akushnet. And uh, as you just heard, the Akushnet was built only seven miles away from and seven months after, uh, seven months before, the Charles W. Morgan. So the Charles W. Morgan's the only whale ship left in the whole world, almost exactly like the Akushnet. Um, and he sailed on the Akushnet for 18 months. And during those 18 months, of course, that's the, the source of his, his sixth book, uh, Moby Dick, and published in 1851. And during the course of that, he uh, stopped in the Galapagos Islands um, in November of 1841 and January of 1842. And that uh, led to a series of sketches, which are called the Incantatas, published in 1854. And then Melville deserted uh, the Akushnet on July 9th, 1842. Uh, you can see I have a, a picture of where the Akushnet was anchored there in Taiohe Bay. And um, he went ashore on the island of Nukahiva and he was on, in the island from July 9th to August 9th, 1842. And that's the source of his first book, Type E, published in 1846. Although um, I have argued um, in various places that in fact, Melville did not uh, spend that time uh, in the Type e Valley. You can see Type Vai on the right, but rather Hakaui Bay, which is to the left. Um, that is part of my argument about Taipei based on a lot of uh, sort of historical, geographical, and textual elements. Um, so uh, then um, Melville was uh, joined uh, uh, another whale ship, the, his second whale ship, which was named the Lucianne, a small Australian whale ship. And he served on, on board her for a short time. He, he joined her on August 9th, 1842. And the, the, the um, ship was terribly managed. The, the captain was, uh, was sick. The first mate was pretty much of a drunkard. There was no second mate. Um, uh, that all the officers had deserted, which is unusual. Men deserted all the time, but not officers. And, um, and they had taken uh, one of the harpooners, an illiterate um, uh, Polynesian harpooner, and, and brought him up to the officer status, but they called him acting third mate. They didn't even give him the title of second mate, they gave him the title of third mate and then acting, which is a way, total way to disempower somebody as an officer. So, um, so the ship was in chaos and the men mutinied. Uh, Melville eventually joined the mutiny. He was incarcerated in a Tahitian jail, escaped by basically walking away one night and went to the next <laughs> island. All that is covered in his second book, Omu, 1847. Um, and then he joined his third whale ship, which of course was his, the best whale ship he was on, the one he had the most respect for, naturally because it was a Nantucket whale ship, um, the Charles and Henry. So he served as a boat steer on the Charles and Henry. Um, and um, that, uh, you know, Nantucket fares so well in Moby Dick. And Melville, as, as I'm sure you all know, actually didn't visit Nantucket until after Moby Dick was published. But, um, but partly it was his, his, his respect for the captain, John B. Coleman Jr., and for the way that ship was run. But, uh, and it led to the beginning of Marty, 1849. But um, 
but uh, he was only signed on for the length of the passage, uh, not, uh, not for the length of the voyage. So he was discharged in Lahaina, Maui, and made his way to Honolulu. And uh, one of the great bits of trivia is what he did in Honolulu. He helped to set up pins in a bowling alley. You know how nowadays they have those machines? That <laughs> so in the days before um, that, they either had children or sailors were often the ones who went in the back of the alley and reset the pins because sailors were so agile. So Melville did that for a little while, um, but uh, he was pretty homesick. And so he joined the, the, the frigate United States, that's the one on the, all the way to the left, and that um, is a sister ship to the Constitution. So even though the, the United States no longer exists, the Constitution built at the same time does. So if you walk around the Constitution and go down in the depths of the ship, it's very much like the one Melville sailed on. And he was on for 14 months, and during those 14 months, he witnessed 163 floggings. Um, and uh, flogging is when a man is hit with a cat of nine tails, so it's not just one mark on their back, it's, it's nine marks. People usually bore the marks of the flogging for the rest of their lives. We had um, some gentleman who visited Mystic Seaport whose grandfather had served on the Morgan and he had been flogged as a, as a teen and his grandsons remembered the marks on his back at the end of his life when he was an old man. So it was horrible, and um, Melville uh, just hated that, and that led to, to the middle chapters of Moby Dick, I mean of, of White Jacket, published in 1850, which excoriated the idea of flogging and the inhumanity of the treatment of men in the United States Navy. Um, and then he returned to uh, Boston in October of 1844. Um, so that was the, the last of his major time at sea, uh, but he did sail again. He sailed around Cape Horn on the clipper ship Meteor under the command of his brother, Thomas, uh, his younger brother, Thomas Melville. This is actually a drawing that, that was done by Melville, uh, I mean, um, by his brother, Thomas Melville. Um, and um, that uh, was the last of his, his uh, uh, trips to sea, but uh, his, the other part of his maritime background that was important was that his cousin, Gert Gansevoort, was part of the drumhead court aboard the Brig Summers that condemned and hung three men, including Philip Spencer, the son of the Secretary of War. And uh, Cap Sir, Captain Alexander Slidell Mackenzie was court-martialed and exonerated, but the, the public remained skeptical about the whole incident. Um, it's often called the only mutiny in the United States Navy and Billy, Budley, Billy Budd, which was published posthumously in 1924, uh, was a result of that, that happening within his family. So these are his major sea works. You can see his early works are especially heavy on, on his time at sea. Then later on, he wrote uh, uh, books more based on land and, and poetry based on land. But, uh, but even at the very end of his life, he's still coming back to that time at sea. So Melville served on three whale ships, working his way up from the position of green hand aboard the Accoucheonet through able seamen on the Lucienne to boat, boat steer on the Charles and Henry. Boat steer is the 19th century term for harp, harpooner. Um, and uh, boat header is the one who actually steered most of the time. The boat steerer is the one who, who was in the front and threw the harpoon. Um, Melville would later claim to his British publisher, Richard Bentley, that he had a personal experience of two years and more as a harpooner, but his time on the Chen Charles and Henry only lasted six months. So he, as, as happened through his whole life, he exaggerated. In, in Moby Dick, Ishmael signs on board the Pequod as a green hand. Like Melville himself, Ishmael had sailed on merchant vessels, but never before on a whale ship. Ishmael is assigned to Starbucks whaleboat crew and serves as bow oarsman, an important position because the bow oarsman is the backup in 19th century terms, the, the preventer uh, for the boat steerer. Ishmael writes in chapter 72, The Monkey Rope, that he is Queequeg's, quote, bowsman. That is the person who pulled the bow oar in his boat, the second one from forward. The Pequod in Moby Dick leaves Nantucket in the dead of winter, just as the Acushnet had left New Bedford. Uh, the Accushionet left um, on January 3rd, 1841, the Pequod on Christmas Day. Such timing was critical to ensure that the vessel reached the southernmost tip of South America with optimal weather conditions for rounding Cape Horn during the Southern Hemisphere summer. 
And as somebody who spent uh, the last 36 years of my life working aloft on a, on a whale ship, I can't even conceive of the idea of having to go aloft in the dead of winter, leaving this part of the country and, and heading south. I know that you're heading into warmer weather, but th those first few times um, working aloft in that, in that incredibly cold weather, it just blows me away. Um, in, intriguingly, despite his own experience with Cape Horn, including his understanding of why a midwinter departure was necessary, and despite the fact that he himself had never sailed around the southern tip of Africa, it is to the Cape of Good Hope that Melville takes the Pequot in chapter 51, The Spirit's Belt. Quote, at last, when turning to the eastward, the Cape winds began howling around us, and we rose and fell upon the long, troubled seas that are there. Cape of Good Hope, do they call ye? Rather, Cape Tormentoso. <laughs> Malville's howling winds and troubled seas better describe Cape Horn, which is at 55.98 degrees south, which lies 21 degrees farther south than the Cape of Good Hope, 34.36 degrees south. So uh, you can see here the, the, the remarkable difference in, in that. That's partly why you know, Cape Horn is the, the scary place, the place we always hear about, is just that remarkably difference in, in where they go. So. Um, Robert K. Wallace, who wrote uh, Melville and Turner in 1992, Douglas and Melville 2005, suggests that Melville sent the Pequot eastward around the Cape of Good Hope because that direction takes longer and therefore would put the Pequot in the optimal position for reaching the equatorial Pacific during the season on the line, the best time for whaling along the equator. Now the Pequot had sailed from Nantucket at the very beginning of the season on the line. No possible endeavor then could enable her commander to make the great passage southwards, double Cape Horn, and then running down 60 degrees of latitude, arrive in the equatorial Pacific in time to cruise there. Therefore, he must wait for the next ensuing season. Yet the premature hour of the Pequod sailing had perhaps been correctly selected by Ahab with a view to this very complexion of things, because an interval of 365 days and nights was before him an interval which, instead of impatiently enduring ashore, he would spend in a miscellaneous hunt. The Pequod is in many ways a fantastical ship, with its belaying pins made of sperm whale teeth and its tiller made from the lower jaw of the sperm whale. It has become, like its captain, quote, a cannibal of a craft, tricking herself forced in the chaste bones of her enemies. Discrepancies within Melville's text and concerning that Pequod abound, the whale ship first has a tiller, but later a wheel. The whalemen sleep mostly in hammocks, but occasionally in bunks. Melville notes that there are 30 men on board. He tells us that four times. But if you are a real Moby Dick nerd like myself and actually count the people individually designated in the book, there are actually roughly 45 people on board. <laughs> and, uh, and one of my favorite things is that um, He's inconsistent as to which leg Ahab is missing. <laughs> sometimes the left, sometimes the right, sometimes above the knee, sometimes below the knee. People are always asking me, I want to be Ahab for, for Halloween. Which leg should I take off? And I'm like, whichever one you want. Melville didn't know. <laughs> yet, in <the> midst of such <laughs> yet in the midst of such discrepancies, Melville has created a grim, trophy-studded vessel that haunts the reader's mind. Under, underneath the haunting quality of the Pequod lies an actual, verifiable, and detailed description of whaling. Melville's understanding of whaling was not only intellectual, aesthetic, and moral, but also kinesthetic. It was that kinesthetic quality that we hope to capture in the summer of 2014 when we took the whale ship Charles W. Morgan to sea on what was known as the 38th voyage. Launched in 1841, the Morgan, the only wooden, remaining wooden whale ship in the world, spent the summer of 2014 sailing throughout New England. She had completed the last of her 37 whaling voyages in 1921. The Morgan is no replica. She is a real, real whale ship, um, you know, as I said earlier, almost exactly like the Akushnet. When the Morgan left Mystic, Connecticut on May 17, 2014, there was no one alive who had ever sailed a whale ship. That's what the captain kept saying. I kept thinking maybe there's some really, really elderly gentleman in some you know, rest home somewhere, but nobody that we could find. Um, what would taking the vessel to sea and lowering whale boats from her davits while underway teach us about Malville's significant, magnificent work? 
Most surprisingly, we learned that the Morgan was quick, swift, and nimble. Whale ships are tubby, meant to carry a large number of oil casts in their hold. And we had long thought the Morgan would be very slow, estimating that she would sail at three to five knots, a little better than three to five miles per hour. But no one had told the Morgan that. And on her very first sea trial, she hit seven and a half knots. She later went over nine knots before the captain thought it prudent to take sail. Um, he, he was thinking that as she was the only whale ship left in the world, maybe he should take down some of the sail. And she clearly could have gone faster. I feel like the ship had listened to us saying that for years, that she was slow and fat. And that was, she was like, I am going to show them. And then we got out to sea and she was incredibly much faster. The Morgan's rudder is tall and narrow, more like a trim tab than a full rudder. And we had thought she would be slow to turn with such a, with such a narrow rudder, but not so. Of all the square riggers on which I have sailed, the Morgan turns by far the fastest. The other thing we learned was how much work is involved in sailing a whale ship. Melville scholars John Bryant and Hester Blum, and also, I, I want to say, uh, Jamie Jones, um, sailed aboard the Morgan, and they each wrote about the amount of labor involved. In an essay entitled, Working, uh, entitled Work, Bryant writes, what I learned is that a ship is a place of work. I had known this intellectually, had read about it a good deal, and had written about it from the perspective of those books in my imagination, but now I could, but now I could see it happening. Bryant ends his essay, work, it is said, is noble, but I don't know what noble means. Work at sea is hard, focused, intense, perilous, immediate. In a piece uh, for the Los Angeles Review of Books, Blum writes, I knew from 15 years of academic research on sea narratives that the work on ships under sail was and is ceaseless and strenuous. The gulf between this book knowledge and its practice under my observation, though, was enormous. I imagine that it yawns all the more between the observation and the act of the labor itself. I thought I knew how hard sailors work. Now I know better. I don't quite know, as I still don't have the experiential knowledge, but I know better. The crew never stopped. They ran up the rigging, untied gaskets, hoisted sails, scooted out on foot ropes along the yard arms, sweated away on the ropes that governed the square ring ship. They paused for a, bit of for a bite of food then had to put their plates down immediately when an order came from the mate to adjust the sails. The speed and agility of the whale ship itself and the amount of seafaring labor required of the crew caused me to sharply question the long-held perception of whalemen as poor sailors. The supposed lubberliness of whalemen pervades 19th century literature. Richard Henry Dana writes in Two Years Before the Mass, published in 1840, Tuesday, November 10th, as soon as her anchor was down, we went aboard and found her to be the whale ship Wilmington and Liverpool packet of New Bedford, last from the offshore ground with 1,900 barrels of oil. A spatter we knew her to be as soon as we saw her by her cranes and boats and by her stump to gallantness and a certain slovenly look to sails, rigging, spars, and hull. And when we got on board, we found everything to correspond, spatter fashion. She had a false deck, which was rough and oily and caught up in every direction by the chines of oil casts. Her rigging was slack and turning white. No paint on the spars or blocks, clumsy seizings of straps without covers, and homeward bound splices in every direction. Her crew too was not in much better order. Her captain was a slab-sided, shamble-legged Quaker in a suit of brown with a broad-brimmed hat and sneaking about decks like a sheep with his head down and the men looked more like fishermen and farmers than they did like sailors. Dana exhibits the typical merchant sailor's contempt for whalemen. The ship itself, the men, the captain, all are slovenly. The sailors don't even know how to do a proper splice or seizing. Such ineptitude is summed up in two ways. First, by the very existence of the term, spouter fashion, and second, by calling the sailors farmers, landsmen, the ultimate insult. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the movie Master and Commander, and uh, remember that how they try disguise the uh, surprise as a whale ship, and uh, and Russell Crowe gets up there and he says, you know, act like whalemen, uh, kind of all you know, lubberly like, and uh, you know, in, uh, uh, slovenly, you know. So this 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 image of whalemen as as not good sailors is all over the place. 
Why whalemen had such a poor reputation can be attributed to several factors. First, whale ships were at sea an average of two to five years. With such a long time away from their home ports, whale ships might certainly become bleached white by the sun and in need of paint. Dana notes the false deck that was nailed above the regular deck to protect the ladder. According to Dana, the false deck was rough and oily and cut up in every direction by the chimes of, cast, chimes of oil cast. Chimes are the topmost hoops on the oil cast that protect the staves from splitting and keep the cast from leaking. Iron hoops would certainly cut up the deck, causing it to become rough, which is precisely why whale ships had a false deck. Second, unlike merchant vessels, whale ships were not trying to make a swift passage from one port to another. Upon reaching the whaling grounds, <coughs> whale ships drifted back and forth, looking out constantly for whales. Yet neither their length of time away from home nor their slowly wandering across the whaling grounds proved that whalemen were not good seamen. Whalemen had to weather Cape Horn en route to the Pacific, keep their ships in good or repair for two to five years, and return home via either Cape Horn or the Cape of Good Hope. Melville vividly describes Cape Horn in White Jacket. You may approach it from this direction of that in any way you please, from the east or from the west, with the wind astern or beam or on the quarter, and still Cape Horn is Cape Horn. Cape Horn it is that takes the conceit out of freshwater sailors and steeps in the still salter brine, the saltest. Mariners called the waves circling Cape Horn gray beards. Such waves could be half a mile long and 100 feet high. The seamanship required to weather such conditions was immense. Despite the skill required to do what they did, a reputation for incompetence and slovenliness clung to whalemen. What Staling on the Morgan made sharply clear, however, was that Melville did not share the negative perception. After experiencing the speed and nimbleness of the Morgan and the seamanship required to sail her, I would argue that Melville transforms not only the whale, but also the whaleman in Moby Dick. Peleg tells Ishmael when he applies to sail on the Pequod, merchant service be damned, talk not that lingo to me. Dost see that leg? I'll take that leg away from thy stern if ever thou talkest of the merchant service to me again. Merchant service indeed. In this moment, sailing as a whaleman is elevated above sailing as a merchant sailor. The skill of the sailors themselves is seen in passages such as the following, which are easily skipped over or lost in the driving excitement of the hunt for the white whale. At the beginning of chapter 133, the chase, first day, Ahab cries to Daegu, call all hands. Thundering with the butts of three clubbed hand stikes on the forecastle deck, Daegu roused the sleepers with such judgment claps that they seemed to exhale from the scuttle. So instantaneously did they appear with their clothes in their hands. What do you see, cried Ahab, flattening his face to the sky. Nothing, nothing, sir, was the sound hailing down in reply. To gallant sails, sunsels, alow and aloft and on both sides. The next paragraph begins simply, all sail being set. The alacrity with which the sailors come on deck and the speed with which they set the to gallant sails, the second highest sails on the mast, and then put up the stunsels, perhaps the most complicated of all sails to set, are not the hallmarks of ineptitude. The sailors in this instance have what Margaret Cohen calls know-how, which she defines as, just gonna read you a little bit of this quote, a particular intelligence, a kind of practical, results-oriented acumen, making use of both the theoretical and practical knowledge, including the most specific detail. Such know-how is expressed in the correct use of language. Melville tells us in Redburn, People who have never gone to sea for the first time as sailors cannot imagine how puzzling and confounding it is. It must be like going into a barbarous country where they speak a strange dialect and dress in strange clothes and live in strange houses. For sailors have their own names, even for things that are familiar ashore. And if you call a thing by its shore name, you are laughed at for an ignoramus and a landlubber. Melville was forced to learn concrete terminology quickly aboard the St. Lawrence. He explains in Redburn, there's such an infinite number of totally new names, of new things to learn, that at first it seemed impossible for me to master them all. If you have ever, ever seen a ship, you must have remarked what a thicket of ropes there are and how they all seem mixed and entangled together like a great skein of yarn. Now the very smallest of these ropes has its own proper name, and many of them are very lengthy, like the names of young royal princes, such as the starboard main to gallant Bolin, or the larboard for, to gallant, uh, for, to, for topsail Clulin. Although Melville's examples seem over the top, they are in fact the true names of lines found on board a square rigged sailing ship. 
Melville is always throws in humor with his, his reference to the names of young royal princes. Remember how Princess Diana uh, you know, memorably uh, put the names of Prince Charles out of order in, during the wedding ceremony? Um, that, that they have all those names. Um, consider Melville's example, the larboard four topsail Cluelin. Many sails have Cluelin, so this particular line is distinguished by the fact that it's a topsail Cluelin. However, a full rigged ship such as the St. Lawrence or the fictional Highlander has three topsails, one on, on each of the three masts. So this particular Cluelin is the Cluelin for the four topsail. Even then, the four topsail is two Cluelins, so the line being referred to is the larboard or port Cluelin. For Joseph Conrad, the technical language of sailors, the very terms of our sea speech, is an instance of perfection. He writes in The Mirror of the Sea, 1906, an anchor is a forged piece of iron, admirably adapted to its end, and technical language is an instrument wrought into perfection by ages of experience, a flawless thing for its purpose. Conrad sees perfection in the concrete quality of nautical terminology. It is a flawless thing. He has aestheticized a language that seems the very opposite of beautiful. A sailor's phrase, he argues, has all the force, precision, and imagery of technical language that created by simple men with keen eyes for the real aspect of the things they see in their trade achieves the just expression, seizing upon the essential, which is the ambition of the artist in words. For Melville, as for Conrad, the true sailors were those who could use such language con correctly. In Billy Budd, Billy's hand tells alike of the halyards and tower bucket. He works with the halyards, which raise the sail, and with tar, which is rubbed into the rigging to preserve it. Billy is a true sailor. He, like white jacket, works on the rigging high above the deck. Correct nautical terminology is inextricable from skill. Melville spent four years in a largely oral world. He was shaped not only by the technical language of mariners, but also by the oral world in which he was immersed. Melville emerged from his time aboard ship as a superb storyteller. His tales of the Marquesas were often repeated to his shipmates in the two years he remained a sailor after joining the whale ship Luciana at New Cahiva on August 9, 1842. His prowess as a storyteller was noted by both his shipmates and his literary coterie. Melville tells us in the preface to Typee, the incidents recorded in the following pages have often served when spun as a yarn, not only to relieve the weariness of many a night watch at sea, but to excite the warmest sympathies of the author's shipmates. Richard Tobias Green, who deserted the Kushnet with Melville at New Cahiva, recalled such yarning when he wrote Melville years later, I would be delighted to see you and freshen the nip while you would be spinning a yarn as long as the main top bullen. Julian Hawthorne, son of Sophia and Nathaniel Hawthorne, gives a vivid account of Melville's storytelling ability in Nathaniel Hawthorne and his wife, 1884. Melville visited with the Hawthorns in the summer of 1851 and told, quote, the story of a fight which he had seen on an island in the Pacific between some savages and of the prodigies of valor one of them performed with a heavy club. After Melville left, Sophia asked her husband, where's that club with which Mr. Melville was laying about him so? Mr. Hawthorne thought he must have taken it with him. Mrs. Hawthorne thought he had put it in the corner, but it was not to be found. The next time Melville came, they asked about it, whereupon it appeared that the club was still in the Pacific Island if it were anywhere. <laughs> For someone whose work is so largely based on written sources, Melville is a remarkably oral writer. The transformative experience of hearing Moby Dick read aloud reinforces its orality. Melville's absorption of sp spoken language, especially that used by sailors and that encountered in interactions with South Pacific Islanders, is apparent in his storytelling. The spoken quality of Melville's storytelling continues even as it is transformed into written text. Um, as he shifted from oral retelling to literary creation, many of the other literary sources on which he drew were likewise rooted in spoken language, best experienced as heard, not read. The plays of Shakespeare, the poetry of Milton, the Bible, sermons. So his, his major sources for Moby Dick, number one, the Bible, number two, Shakespeare, number three, Milton, all of those, um, and sermons, the sermons greatly influenced him, are are things that most people have heard spoken rather than written. Moby Dick is far more than a story of wailing. In chapter 16, Peleg describes Ahab as a grand, ungodly, godlike man, and Moby Dick itself is a grand, ungodly, godlike book. A book of blasphemy, it is also full of humor, which is in turn sly, boisterous, poignant, and hilarious. Moby Dick asks all the central questions of life. What is truth? Who are we? Does immortality exist? 
but answers none of them. The importance of the work, however, lies in asking such eternal questions. Most of all, it is the soaring language of Moby Dick that endures. Whaling and language are exquisitely combined in chapter 48, the forced lowering, when the whale boat is separated from the Pequod and the whalemen are forced to spend the night on the open sea. So, cutting the lashing of the waterproof match keg, after many failures, Starbuck, the first mate, contrived to ignite the lamp and the lantern, then stretching it on a wave pail, handed it to Queequeg as the standard bearer of this forlorn hope. There then he sat, holding up that imbecile candle in the heart of that almighty forlornness. There then he sat, the sign and symbol of a man without faith, hopelessly holding up hope in the midst of despair. The intertwining of whaling and language became visceral for me during the 38th voyage of the Charles W. Morgan when we lowered a whaleboat and I pulled one of the oars as we rowed amongst a pod of humpback whales. Melville quotations swarmed through me. Chapter 48, the first lowering. Not the raw recruit marching from the bosom of his wife into the fever heat of his first battle. Not the dead man's host encountering the first unknown phantom in the other world. Neither of these can feel stranger and stronger emotions than that man does who for the first time finds himself pulling into the charmed churn circle of the hunted sperm whale. Chapter, um, chapter 49, the hyena, when Ishmael asks, will you tell me whether it is an unalterable law in the fishery, Mr. Flass, for an oarsman to break his own back, pulling himself back foremost into death's jaws? Chapter 60, which uh, you heard some quotations from a little earlier today. The line, nor can any son of mortal woman for the first time seat himself amid those humpen intricacies and while straining his utmost at the oar, bethink him that at any unknown instant the harpoon may be darted and all these horrible contortions be put in play like ring lightnings. It cannot be thus circumstanced without a shudder that makes the very marrow, marrow in his bones to quiver in him like shaken jelly. Deeply, profoundly moving as Melville's words are, they nevertheless had remained visceral to us only as language. Until the summer of 2014, the full body, shot, full body shudder that they evoked arose from the power of the language itself, rather than for participation in the encounter he described. The experience of rowing a whale boat amongst a group of cetaceans and seeing the size and majesty of the whales from such a seemingly small and fragile vessel was overwhelming. At first exhilarating, and then a little terrifying. It is no wonder then that Melville's language soars. He had acquired not only nautical terminology, the very terms of our sea speech, and the oral skill of a superb storyteller from his time at sea, but also a sense of the divine. Moby Dick begins, call me Ishmael. In Genesis, the first book of the Bible, Ishmael is the son of Abraham and of Hagar, who is the servant of Abraham's wife, Sarah. When Sarah gives birth to Isaac, Ishmael and Hagar are exi exiled to the desert. The narrator of Moby Dick asks us to call him by a name that signifies outcast, wanderer. Moby Dick ends with an epilogue that begins with a quotation from the book of Job, and I only am, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee, and ends heartbreakingly with the word orphan. Thank you. Thank you.